Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Doesn't, uh, doesn't look like we had much uh, attrition since this morning, so that's great. Um, this, welcome to the third session of the day. Uh, I think it was, we had some great presentations, just like we did this morning. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if you mind indulging me for just a second, though. I'd like to plug an event that's going to happen uh, right here, same time, tomorrow. It's a presentation by Adam Schultz. He's an author from, uh, from uh, the Long Point Biosphere region, and he's uh, talking about his book, Where the Falcon Flies, and it's intertwined with the region. It's uh, organized by Book um, Beach Reads uh, Bookstore here in uh, Port Dover that's been really good to us in promoting this event and other things. So I wanted to give a plug for that. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is uh, Jessica Linton, who I believe is present. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we'd find somebody to pretend they were you. Anyways, uh, Jessica's uh, with uh, Natural Resources Solutions, which is a consulting firm with offices in Waterloo and Calgary. They provide ecological services in places all across Canada, and Jessica is a senior terrestrial and wetland biologist with the firm. Uh, she's also a member of COSAWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, the um, arthropod uh, specialist subcommittee of Kasawek, and she is the chair of the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk Recovery Team. And, coincidentally, her specialty is monitoring butterflies, not just to inventory them, but also to conduct uh, behavior monitoring and migration studies. She's going to talk about the recovering rare tall, uh, tall grass butterfly communities here in Long Point as an indicator for the ecosystem health. And she, like others, has 15 minutes, and then we'll accept questions. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, just before I get started, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the organizers of this conference and just conferences in general. There's a lot of young people I see in the audience today. And about I was just connecting with Brian Craig about this. About 20 years ago, I met Brian Craig at a conference in Penticton, fresh out of undergrad with no prospects on the horizon. And he said, well, like, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know, but I love butterflies, and I want to do something related to butterflies. And Brian was working in Environment Canada at the time, and he actually gave me my first contract working on butterflies out of my undergrad, and it really changed the trajectory of my career. So thank you, Brian. I'm still working on butterflies. And um, yeah, I think conferences like this are really important for young people making those connections. So don't underestimate uh, the effect that you could have on young people that you see here today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about reestablishing Long Point's rare butterfly communities. Um, I have a lot of information that kind of went into the background of this project, which I'm briefly going to touch on, um, but I'm not going to have time in 15 minutes to go over all of it. So I welcome questions um, afterwards, and also please feel free to connect with me. I have my contact information up at the end. So um, as the introductory speaker noted, um, I'm primarily focused on butterflies and tall grass habitat communities. And for those of you who aren't familiar with tall grass communities, they include tall grass prairie, oak savanna, and oak woodland here in the Long Point area, um, prim primarily associated with black oak when I say oak. And historically, these communities covered a large proportion of the Long Point area, upwards of 11%, it's estimated. This map here shows just generally the estimated historical uh, extent of oak savanna in the Long Point area and slightly beyond the priority place, which is outlined in orange. Moving forward, this is what the current extent of tall grass habitats look like in this area now. So the little pink patches you see are prairie, the lime green areas are tall grass um, oak savanna habitats, and then the dark green patches are oak woodland. And so the oak woodlands are primarily um, naturally occurring and intact remnants um, after agricultural clearing. But most of the savannas and prairies um, have been restored or are entirely created. Um, and you can see they're small and patchily distributed. Um, over not, almost 90% of them are less than one hectare in area. Um, and so that's not a great story to have to tell. But there's a lot of work being done right now through the Priority Place Initiative and a lot of the great organizations that are here today to restore these habitats back on Long Point's um, landscape. 
So the rare butterfly communities that were associated with these um, habitats um, are unique to some of these systems. So butterflies, uh, you know, they occur over a wide range of habitats. We know of lots of butterfly generalists, like monarch butterfly, depends on milkweed, it occurs in any little weedy patch you find along a roadside. A lot of butterflies are actually really specialized, so they occur only in specific habitats and are associated with one or maybe two plants. And so these four species used to occur in the Long Point area. Firstly, we have the Eastern Perseus duskywing, a small spread wing skipper butterfly in the genus Arinus. Um, we don't even have a photo of it, so that's why I have a photo of a specimen here. Um, not very easy to identify, but it was dependent on wild lupin, which is a species that only occurs in tall grass habitats. Next, we have the model duskywing. This is a species you'll hear me talk more about today. Um, also a spread wing skipper butterfly, and in Long Point area, totally dependent on New Jersey tea as a larval food plant. Next is the frosted elfin, um, and then of course the carner blue on the far right there. So both of them are in the family Lysinidae. Um, they're associated with wild lupin as well, only occurred in tall grass habitats, and St. William's Conservation Reserve and around the Bacchus Woods area was the only location for these species in the Long Point area. So um, all of these species are gone now from this area. Uh, Eastern Perseus duskywing hasn't been seen since 86, um, model duskywing since 1987, frosted elf in 1988, and carner blue since 1991. And all of these species are listed as species at risk in Ontario. Unfortunately, Eastern Perseus duskywing, frosted elf in, and carner blue are actually extirpated from Ontario and therefore Canada. The model duskywing is the only one we have hanging on here. Um, and it occurs primarily the stronghold is in the Rice Lake Plains area, but there are also small disjunct populations in the Burlington Oakville area, as well as in Simcoe County and down on Walpole Island. So Eastern Perseus duskywing is listed as endangered slash extirpated because technically um, at the federal level it's considered endangered, but only because Kasiewicz's criteria for listing something as extirpated is its absence for 50 years. And because it's almost impossible to identify, they won't go as far as to say it's gone, but the province considers it gone, and I consider it gone. <laughs> so there are recovery strategy documents for these species of butterfly. Um, there's a federal recovery strategy for Eastern Perseus, Duskywing, Frosted Elfin, and Carner Blue. It's a joint recovery strategy because those three butterfly species all occurred in the same habitats and were dependent on the same host plant, wild lupin. Um, there's a provincial recovery strategy for the model duskywing. And for those of you who are not familiar with recovery strategies, they're simply just a planning document that um, outlines the steps that are needed to conserve and protect a species at risk and what steps need to be taken to reverse the decline of a species. So they provide information on biology, what the threats are to the species, um, and what the uh, overall goals and objectives for recovery are. So, um, for every species at risk, the federal and provincial government have requirements if a species is listed as extirpated, endangered, or threatened um, to develop a recovery strategy. And so all of the threats to these species, um, in addition to uh, the obvious one that I showed those maps at the beginning of habitat loss, they're also subjected to the confounding factors of habitat fragmentation because they've were pushed into these little isolated pockets of tall grass habitat. Um, and then within those small pockets, they suffer from habitat mismanagement. So for those of you who are not familiar with tall grass habitats, um, they do require some sort of disturbance to maintain the system. They're um, usually associated with nowadays prescribed fire or mowing or some other management tool. Historically, they were stewarded by indigenous peoples who regularly used fire as part of their cultural practices and way of life, which kind of kept things open. So wild lupin and New Jersey tea, the plants that these butterflies depend on, don't like shade. And when things get overgrown, they're um, some of the first plants to disappear. Um, of course, invasive species are also problematic. We hear about invasive species being problems for all species nowadays, similarly with climate change. And then also pesticide use, and in particular for these rare butterflies, aerial spraying of BTK, which is used to control spongy moths, invasive spongy moths, 
um, is a concern, a great concern for these species. And anecdotally, they have been known to disappear from other species following, or other places following BTK spraying. So in 2017, um, I founded the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk Recovery Team with the explicit purpose of carrying out some of the actions that are identified in these recovery strategies for these butterfly species at risk. This is a picture of the team at our first meeting at the Toronto Zoo. Um, and it's a really great collaborative group. Um, all of the people and organizations that are a part of it were working on some aspect of either butterfly recovery or research or tall grass habitat um, restoration. So this was a way for us all to kind of come together with the collective goal of um, restoring tall grass habitats. And for me, the explicit purpose of reintroducing these butterflies back onto our landscape. So now I'm just gonna run you through a few of the projects that we've been working on over the last few years that have kind of led to where we are now in Norfolk County. Um, the first of which is captive rearing. So our partner the, at the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory has been rearing butterflies in captivity now for five years. It started with a surrogate species, um, the wild indigo dusky wing, which is a very common dusky wing species in Ontario. And then we moved on to um, captive rearing model dusky wing. And the reason we decided to focus on model dusky wing first is because it's the only butterfly of these oak savanna specialists that we still have left in Ontario. So we brought them into captivity, and that allowed us to learn about their life history, things that we didn't know. I'd never even seen like a pupa um, before, so we got to see what a pupa looked like. Um, we also learned about just husbandry techniques. What did we need to do in, in terms of environmental perimeters and husbandry to keep them alive? And then of course, we've been able to head start butterflies for reintroduction. Next is research. So research is a huge component of what the recovery team is doing. Um, we have collaborations with York University, University of Guelph, and um, the University of Western Ontario. And primarily uh, for model duskywing, things have been focused on getting population estimates of our existing populations, as well as just filling in knowledge gaps. We, don't, we didn't know anything about how far they're able to fly or disperse, how long they live in the wild, uh, what their phenology is from year to year. So we've been able to answer some of those questions. Um, we've graduated one master's student. We have another one who's completing a master's right now. And then we also have a PhD student all working on model dusky wing. So that's a huge uh, amount of information we've been able to get over the last five years on these species. And then another component of the work that we're doing is on genetics. So when you're talking about recovering a species, obviously genetic diversity, especially when you're bringing things into captivity and rearing them is a really important consideration for our reintroduction program. Um, more recently, we also started doing some research on frosted elfin. So if you recall, I mentioned that frosted elfin is extirpated from Canada. Um, and so a lot of the work that I was doing this year was focused down in New York, where there are extant populations of this species still. And we are looking at Norfolk County and potential reintroduction locations in Norfolk County. So um, a lot of the work I was doing this year was just looking at habitat perimeters at existing populations and comparing it to the habitat that we have here in Norfolk County. Um, and then also just studying the butterfly. I, I, for any of you who work on animals, you know, it's nice to have like a relationship with your study species. And I'd only seen frosted elephant once in the wild on a field trip one time. So I just went down to like hang out with it for a while and get to know it a little bit. Not a bad way to spend your summer. And then many of our partners on the recovery team um, are focused on habitat restoration. So here in the Long Point uh, Walsingham Forest Priority Place area, especially Nature Conservancy of Canada and the St. Williams Conservation Reserve, as well as the Long Point Basin Land Trust, have all been diligently working on acquiring and restoring land. Um, and they've made tremendous headway in terms of increasing the amount of tall grass habitat on the landscape again, but also reintroducing the larval food plants of these butterflies, including wild lupin and New Jersey tea. Um, and then, of course, the most exciting part of what we're doing is the reintroduction. So um, in 2021, we were able to successfully reintroduce model dusky wing to Pinery Provincial Park, um, where it had been absent for uh, over three decades. And that's a program that's continued since that time. And we are seeing evidence of a self-sustaining population there. They're overwintering, they're mating, they're producing double broods, all things that we wanna see in, in our population. 
Um, and then we're also planning, because of the success of Pinery, a reintroduction of model duskywing in Norfolk County in 2024. And of course, as part of any good um, project, I think outreach and stewardship is a really important part of that. So I basically will go and talk to any group who's interested in hearing about butterflies. I'd counted the other day on my list and I've done 36 presentations in the last three years on model duskwing recovery. So you probably a lot of people in this room have maybe even heard me speak before about it. Um, we also have a, a documentary coming out. Um, that's a full-length documentary about our reintroduction program to Pinery, which is a great way to like reach just the general public about the work that we're doing. Not only about butterfly recovery, but about tall grass system recovery and why that is important. Why it's important to use tools like um, prescribed fire. These are things that are generally not really known to the general public. We have a recovery team website, we have swag and apparel, and we even have a model dusky wing beer. Um, so these are obviously desperate attempts to get at all the groups of people uh, as attention. So just to give you some context about where we're looking at in the Long Point Walsingham Forest Priority Place area, um, we're looking at doing our butterfly reintroductions in and around the St. Williams Conservation Reserve and Bacchus Block um, area of, uh, where NCC owns quite a bit of land. Um, mainly because there's lots of uh, larger patches of habitat that have some connectivity and are within the reasonable distance that we can expect our butterfly communities to interact. So through all of this, you're probably wondering why butterflies? Well, you know, as many of you know, there's been a huge investment of time and resources into the priority place area to create habitat, including tall grass habitat. But for many species like butterflies, you know, it's outside of their reasonable range of flight to expect that they'll be able to colonize these areas on their own. So it's one thing to put the habitat back, but sometimes the species that used to inhabit them need our help to get there as well. Um, so for example, for model duskywing, the closest population would be Burlington. So that's hundreds of kilometers away. So we're just kind of giving them a little bit of help to get reestablished uh, within their former range. Um, butterflies are also great biological indicators, and I was so excited to see, I think it was Hadil said something about that in her presentation, because it's a mantra that I have been spitting out for years, and I think I even used that to pitch my first job idea to Brian uh, many years ago, but, you know, they're relatively cost-effective to measure, they're visible in the landscape, they're super sensitive to changes in their environment. So when butterflies started disappearing from the Long Point area, that was a really, um, uh, sad indication that things were going really wrong in those ecosystems. So now that we've done all this work to bring the habitat back, putting the butterflies back there and monitoring them is a pretty easy way to monitor if what we're doing is um, successful. Because if it can support the butterflies, then chances are it's supporting a host of other species as well. So just in terms of our plans for 2024, as I mentioned, we are going to be doing a reintroduction of model dusky wing into uh, the Long Point area. Our first uh, plan is to reintroduce them at an NCC property, and if we have enough um, butterflies, probably St. Williams as well. Um, currently, the larvae are diapausing, so sleeping, uh, at the Phytotron at the University of Guelph. Um, so we have several hundred that are ready to go in the spring. Um, we also are looking at doing a diapausing larva experiment. So we've had the luxury, because the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory has done such a great job of rearing, of playing around with different treatment options at Pinery. And we have released um, pupa there, mature larva, and adult butterflies. And we found that adult butterflies have worked out the best, which is why we want to proceed with that in Norfolk. Um, but we haven't tried diapausing larva. And if that treatment does work, it would save us the time and cost of overwintering them in captivity. So it's something that we'll probably try in Norfolk at a fresh, clean site. Um, and then we also plan to apply for a new NSERC Alliance grant, which is a huge undertaking, but um, that's what the NSERC Alliance has supported the work that the recovery team has been doing for the last five years. Um, it's a large collaborative industrial academic partnership. So we're going to be uh, applying to continue the model dusky wing work for the next five years. We're also going to be applying to do uh, more work on frosted elfin. In, uh, which will probably include bringing them back to Canada and starting a population here in captivity to use in releases for the future. 
Um, and then, we're, uh, really exciting, we're also partnering with the Wilder Institute at the Calgary Zoo um, to help them with their Half Moon Hair Streak uh, recovery project. So, what started out as a relatively small thing focused on one species is quickly becoming more of um, a Canada-wide recovery program for butterfly species at risk. And then beyond 2024, um, we're going to continue doing our reintroduction monitoring at Pinery. Um, we will be running a monitoring program in Norfolk County to make sure that the butterflies we release here are establishing the way that we want them to. Um, and then we are looking seriously at doing reintroductions of frosted elfin as well. Now, everybody always asks me, what about Carner Blue? I know some of you are thinking it right now. Um, so Carner Blue is also dependent on wild lupin, um, but it has a much greater habitat demand than in frosted elfin does. So in the States, they've been doing a ton of recovery work on Carner Blue. Um, they estimate that it requires at least 150 hectares of habitat, um, preferably in five to nine larger spaced out habitats. So, that's a lot of land, and we just don't have that sort of habitat here in Ontario yet. Um, so, you know, it's not that it won't ever happen, and everything that we're doing for model duskywing and frost, frosted elfin is certainly in consideration of reintroducing some other species like Carner Blue, but we're just not there yet. So I'll save you asking me about that after my presentation. Um, so I'd just like to end with my acknowledgements. Um, of course, you can probably... Uh, see from my presentation that there's a huge amount of work going on among the recovery team. We have a lot of collaborators that have made this work possible, so i just like to acknowledge them. And of course, um, it takes a lot of funding to do all this work, so I'd like to acknowledge our funders as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And uh, just a reminder, if you could come to the microphone to pose questions. Yeah. Everyone's like, I was going to ask about Carner Blue. Yeah. <laughs> um, I understand that the controlled burn process is rather onerous. I don't know if you agree or not. Do you think that could really, really thwart these efforts in the medium and long term if they're unable to get past th those logistics of burning when it needs to be burned? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm sure there are some people in this room that have strong opinions and, and um, could probably answer this question better than me. But it was very telling to me when I've, so I've been doing this work down in New York on frosted elfin. Um, and so I had the chance to visit the Albany pine bush while I was there, which is a stronghold for the Carner Blue, frosted elfin, and model dusky wing. I saw like all three of them there. It was crazy. Um, and they burn whenever and whatever they want. They're like cowboys down there. They burn in every season, you know, and they just do it. And the habitat is spectacular. Um, but they really aren't constrained by the same things that we are here in Ontario with like very narrow prescriptions for when we can do burns. Um, you know, a lot of them for very valid reasons like safety um, and visibility on our roads and stuff. But Certainly, I do think that it is hindered a bit now. Um, because the MNR stopped their burn program, um, I think we're really limited in the types of burns we can do now, because before when the MNR was doing it, we could do more high complexity burns. And now they happen just at a much smaller scale um, by private contractors, which is also very costly. So, yeah. Well, you better come to the mic, you're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> like to add to that answer because we own a farm uh, where we did prescribed burns as of uh, 2009 and we've continued it till 2021 and uh, we never had any problems on a farm you can probably do whatever you want to but uh, I would definitely say uh, you shouldn't be limited by anybody to do prescribed burns because um, I know I shouldn't probably say that but as an independent uh, uh, what's that entrepreneur, um, you cannot have yourself told what to do because then you couldn't do anything. Um, therefore, um, I would always think for landowners, whomever they are, that there would be opportunities to uh, follow up on the need for prescribed burns. Mm, thank you for that comment. I think we'd all just take up smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Jessica. Yeah, that, was, that was awesome. That was great.
So our, our next uh, speaker is uh, Kerry Gunson and Lauren Nightingale. Uh, they uh, work for EcoCare International, a road ecology consulting firm uh, based in Peterborough. And their presentation is entitled Implementing My Mitigation to Reduce More Road Mortality and Improve Habitat Connectivity uh, for At-Risk Reptiles Across Long Point and Walsingham Forest Priority Place. Kerry has worked as a full-time road ecologist across North America for 24 years, and she's now considered the primary road ecologist for planning, designing, monitoring work in Ontario and other places. And she has, as well, uh, been, been appointed as the project manager for road ecology working group for the Long Point Biosphere and the Priority Place. And she's been working with her technician, Lauren Nightingale, to implement roadkill mitigation strategies for at-risk reptiles across uh, Long Point region. And we're very uh, privileged to have the two of them associated with us in the Long Point Biosphere region. So today they're going to be talking about context-specific road mitigation projects. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Thank you for the intro. Dick. So EcoCare now is um, happy to say that we have two offices or headquarters, one in Port Rowan, run by Lauren, who will speak right after me, and in Peterborough, and I run all over Ontario, and Lauren gets to stay here and do all the fun work in Long Point, Walsingham Forest. Road ecology is the interactions of roads with the environment, wildlife, vegetation, hydrology, water, and we try and figure out from an ecological perspective what we need to um, reduce road mortality of our wildlife and fragmentation effects of our wildlife. I'm a zoologist, ecologist, so I'm biased towards wildlife, but I also find that I have to work a lot with water too because um, we can use the infrastructure that they build to convey water under roads, bridges and culverts, to um, increase permeability for wildlife. So we try and get wildlife to use those culverts so that they can cross safely. And so with that, we have to work with the road planning agencies, such as Norfolk County here, to be able to use their infrastructure or build onto their infrastructure. And then when they're upgrading their roads, we can put more of these things in. There's other strategies as well, which I will talk about. So that brings us to Norfolk County, Long Point, Walsingham Forest, Priority Place. Four years ago, we started by uh, a landscape context where we mapped all the reptile wildlife on road data for the county, and we tried to figure out where there would be hot spots with the habitat that's adjacent to each road. And we came up with the map with these little red dots, and of course, Turkey Point Marsh area came out, and Long Point area, we knew about those, but we wanted to know about other hot spots. So what we found in that, this is showing all the different data sets that we included in that exercise, which was um, all the stakeholders, partners, Ontario Nature, NHIC, all that data. So we have a database now of over 5,000 records. And um, what we found was, you need hotspots, you need road mortality, unfortunately, to convince them to do something. So you need the roadkill, um, but I mean, it could have been roadkill historically, but um, you have to give them something to grab onto to be able to implement things. So we came up, we found that, having said that, there was a lot of maybe smaller hotspots. We didn't focus on those, we focused on three areas, and um, we developed this strategy or this work plan, and we put it together, and we're implementing this year. So our first um, bullet on our work plan was seasonal signage at our selected hotspots. We selected County Road, County Road 60, Erie Boulevard, and Front Road at Turkey Point Marsh as our three selected hotspots. This is for turtle road, road mortality and snake road mortality, and turtles, um, we know that there's a lot of species at risk turtles, and all of them um, are affected by road mortality, and so are many of our snakes, especially the eastern fox snake. So we worked at the hotspots, putting the signs up. Then we 
worked at putting up some mitigation. Um, that was exclusion fencing, where we knew they were crossing onto Front Road. And then we are currently drawing up a conceptual mitigation plan on County Road 60 that already has that infrastructure I was talking about for water, the Big Creek Valley. And so we'll add exclusion fencing to that. Then we have Wildlife Road Watch, which Lauren will tell you all about. And that's a community-based science group. And those are eff effective mitigation because you can find the turtles and lift them across the road so they don't get run over. So this sign shows where we put our signs. You might see them, watch for turtle. They're really big signs. It shows you Brian helped, Brian and our crew um, put up signs and design, helped design them for us and because um, I had no idea how to um, put up signs. So I don't think I would have been able to get that. I mean, Lauren and I wouldn't have been able to get that done without help. Um, Ecofence at Eco Adventures, where we saw Blanding's turtles crossing, is we want to put nesting substrate so that they would come up from Turkey Point Marsh, use the nesting substrate, and not cross the road. And the fence would kind of funnel them where to go. That shows that, us putting in the um, nesting mound. And so what we did was we added gravel and sand into that excavated part that you saw. And Lauren will tell you all about that. And we kind of copied down the road. There was a viewpoint where there was a chain link fence. And we, w we saw that the snapping turtles were stopping at that chain link fence and nesting right there. So we mimicked that um, just down the road. Kent Road 60 is a whole big story. We're trying to um, get the stakeholders funding for a conceptual mitigation strategy to um, uh, target eastern fox tanks. And as I said, there's this big creek infrastructure there, so we can tie into that. And we also have two ecosystems, the Wasingham Forest, Carolinian Forest, and the Big Creek Valley. And we have a massive wildlife corridor, the Big Creek Valley, going southerly to the National Wildlife Area. So very key spot. In that watershed, the Big Creek watershed, County Road 60, has the road mortality I was talking about, has the infrastructure and it has traffic volumes, so we need to mitigate that. And then we need to get a stewardship program implemented so that the motorists and the people that live there know to watch out for these snakes. That's our conceptual mitigation strategy on County Road 60. And with that, I'm going to introduce Lauren um, for the Wildlife Watch. So I'm Lauren Nightingale, and uh, I coordinated the second year for Wildlife Road Watch. So last year I volunteered with the program, and then I started working for Carrie, and this year I got to run it. Uh, so Wildlife Road Watch is a community-based science program where we train our volunteers to patrol um, three turtle road crossing hotspots during nesting season and record wildlife um, on road observations. And we make sure that any turtles we find make it safely across the road. So roads are a major factor in the decline of our turtle species. Um, thanks to them thinking roads are a great place to lay their eggs, um, it can take up to 20 years for a turtle to reach breeding age. So we don't want to lose any nesting females. Okay, so two of our three patrol locations were on Long Point. There was Hastings Drive and Erie Boulevard. Erie Boulevard's also a very busy snake spot, so that's why I picked a picture of a little garter snake. Um, and our third hot spot is along Front Road that Carrie was talking about from the Subak viewing area and our eco fence at Eco Adventures. So you can hopefully see, well you can't, there's three, there's three snappers nesting in that picture. And then this picture, there are two turtles crossing the road at the same time. I was literally sprinting up and down the road trying to get these turtles off the road around June 15th because there were just that many trying to cross. So for our wildlife observations to be considered research grade, we need a photograph of the animal, date and time, coordinates, the species, and the road status. Ideally, your phone have your location data turned on so we can, that all we really need is the photograph, all that info will be in the, the metadata for the coordinates and the time. So you can upload your photos directly to our project on iNaturalist, or you can send them directly to my email. Uh, that way, even if you don't know the species or the life stage, we can get that information from the picture. Okay, so year one, 
we focused on just getting observations and getting the turtles off the road, but this year we really expanded on that. So if a turtle is nesting on the roadside, in order to make sure they get back safely, you'd have to wait until they finish nesting. So at that point, we're going through that trouble anyway. We may as well come up with strategies to protect the nests as well. So we unfortunately did find 14 dead adults, but we were able to protect at least 180 on the roads um, during nesting season. We had a total of 364 observations for all species, so snakes and birds, mammals too. Um, just one more thing to note here is there's actually quite a few hatchlings that come out in the spring. Um, generally, they come out in the fall, but some will stay in the nest chamber over winter, like this little tiny painted turtle right here. And this is just a collage of a bunch of our rescued turtles. So the picture right in the middle, I don't know how well you can see that. It's just an example of where they will nest. It's literally right on the road shoulder and they'll be there for hours. So they're at risk of getting hit that entire time. Uh, so why do we cover the nests or deal with the excavation? So this little guy, raccoons, possums, coyotes, they will, they dig them all up, <laughs> basically. Oh wait, I wanted to show you. You can kinda, I don't know how well you see, but right in the foreground is actually a temporary nest cover we had put down in the morning. And as I drove up, this little guy was digging them up and he'd made it through. <laughs> so I just wanted to show that. Okay, so here sort of, you can see there's a reinforced chain link uh, nest cover that we put up at the viewpoint. We didn't use the typical nest boxes at the viewpoint because we we're worried about poachers. But then right next to it is a nest that we missed with the eggs strewn everywhere. And uh, this picture on the right, I'm sort of really proud and sort of disappointed with this one. Um, I drove up and there was a raccoon digging under a female who had just finished nesting. She hadn't even buried her eggs yet and just moved the turtle and dug out right from under her. So there were three broken eggs, but I managed to grab six. Um, and since the nests are laid in a straight line along the road, basically every single one will get eaten. The predators just walk along the roadside and they sniff them all out and they get them all. Okay, and for the lucky few that don't get eaten, um, they're at extremely high risk of getting run over when they try to cross. They're tiny, they're about the size of a loony, uh, and since they're turtles, when they get spooked by passing traffic, they'll just hide in their shells and sit in the middle of the road, and so it's really just a matter of time before they get squished. So to prevent that, so to prevent that, um, we wanted to excavate the eggs and then you know, let the eggs hatch and release them directly into the marsh to get rid of that concern. So this picture, I don't know how well you see, is taken at 2 a.m. Uh, when the female finally finished laying. Um, so I and a few of our volunteers were trained to take the eggs out. We would carefully dig down by hand and get them out one by one. You don't change the orientation, then you pack them in moist vermiculite or just the original nest substrate, and then we drive them off to incubators. So all told, we covered 14 nests, excavated 51, nine of which were at the eco fence. We had a 93% hatch rate uh, by Scott Gillingwater's team at the London Watershed Conservation Center. Um, Scott also provided all of our training um, for excavating the nests, so really big thank you to him. Uh, we had a total of 862 hatchlings and the 62 blandings I really want to point out because one, they're endangered and two, they were horrible for just digging and then changing their mind. There was one night I was out for six hours watching two and neither of them laid eggs and they just both turned around and went back. Okay. Um, so part of our hatchling release protocol is they needed to be released within one kilometer from their nest site. So on Front Road, that was actually a 45 minute round trip down the hill at Eco Adventures uh, into the marsh, which was beautiful, uh, but the water is so much further away than you think. And it's another reason we wanted to excavate those eggs because um, we really don't think the hatchlings can make the trip. Oh, I don't know how well this shows, but this is a map 
of the long point. Um, you can't really see, maybe you can see. The red dots are our release sites and the big purple dots are the nests. I really just wanted to show this to illustrate how closely we stuck to um, that one kilometer distance for the release sites. And I just wanted to show a bunch of pictures of the little babies. Um, so this one is a little map that's a painted and these are snappers and these bottom two are blandings. And also I wanted to show these pictures because they were taken by our volunteer photographer, Chris Vickerson. Uh, you can really see their little adorable egg tooth on the tips of their noses that helps them break out of the shells. And all of this would not have been possible without our volunteers um, and our amazing community, Eco Adventures. Um, everybody here just really does care about turtles. Um, and the support we get really makes the difficult parts of the job, like finding dead turtles all the time, <laughs> a lot easier to deal with. A uh, big thank you to Hobbit Sea Wildlife Refuge. Um, they took in our injured turtles and a bunch of our eggs as well. And of course, thank you to the biosphere. And we do have a video sh that we wanted to show. Yes, there's the turtle, laid a nest, and our volunteer was right there to dig them up. And then number two, and then that was Heather. There she comes back. There she is. <laughs> there. So come back up, Gary. Come back up. No, you come back up. <laughs> I think uh, Carrie was right. You get to do the fun stuff. Okay. <laughs> oh, great. Go ahead. <laughs> there is some. Um, a couple papers out that say that raccoons and predators can't find turtle nests as well along roads um, as compared to the wild because they're more clumped in the wild, I think, and then they're more spread in the roads, so fewer get predated along roads. But I don't, there's not good evidence on that. Did you no. actually see a raccoon going down the roadside? Oh, side? yeah. I yeah. saw one night I was watching a Blandings, and there was a raccoon and two possums straight up just walking the road. Walking the road, not yeah. going like just... No, it was right straight new. down the road. Yeah. Was that, was that on Hastings? This was, there was Front Road and Hastings. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we should write that up. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so great. <laughs> so you're, you're not unhappy when you see uh, raccoon roadkill? I mean, I, I did actually take a picture of one, and I labeled it. It was like <laughs> one less nemesis or whatever. But yeah, I, I love them anyway. I don't care. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> Thanks for that presentation. It was great, you guys. Um, and some of our road ecology projects where we've put wildlife fencing up along roads, we're finding that especially... Um, in some instances, depending on the type of fence we're in, that turtles are getting disoriented along the fences. Um, and it's actually leading to mortality to have the fence up. And I was wondering what type of monitoring you guys do in these areas where you're putting up fence to see, like just to track if there's actually mm -hmm. issues with that. Well, we did a, a lot of monitoring uh, along the causeway this year, specifically with like there's two different types of fencing. There's the fencing that we patched, the green shade cloth, and then there's the stuff the county put up, the silver mesh. I think there's concerns about the silver mesh because they can see through it mm -hmm. where they'll just keep trying to get through. I did see evidence of that with frogs. Actually, there was a leopard frog that had been jumping against that mesh fence and actually has his nose all bruised. I only found one like that, but I did find a few that you know had dehydrated and died. So you can't really, they just turned so into it's, black. It's the visibility. It's a vi that yeah, it's a visibility be. thing. And sorry, just one more follow up. So when you're, you have these fences, are you actually just hoping they stay in nest on that side of the fence or are you physically yeah. moving them over the fence? Well, we time? hope they're gonna nest on the outside of the fence because then at least the hatchlings even when they do come up, they can just go straight that way right. and they'll turn around. Um, so where you're physically. moving turtles is where you don't have fence. Yeah, like, okay. so it, it's hard on like the causeway, for example, like say they get in on the east side where the fence is like right there and people will move them to the west side. Well, the fence is all the way in the marsh. So if you put them on that side, they're still trapped inside the fence. So we really, 
not ideal. The ideal thing would be to get them on the outside of the fence if you find them on the inside. <laughs> Thank and you. the direction they're traveling. The effective of our eco fence was it was only 240 meters long. It was just to capture them when they were coming along there, see to, to finesse there instead of going into the agricultural field. Okay. Oh, the eco fence, right? Yeah. The eco fence. The eco fence is different. <laughs> But, but on the causeway, it's to funnel them into the culverts and stuff? Is that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's for funneling and excluding. You're supposed to be up here to be in the microphone. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I should have made you come back. There. <laughs> well, thanks very much. That was awesome. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you. So the uh, final speaker in this session is Eli Winberg. And I'm looking for Eli. To... Oh, great. Hi. Uh, Eli's a student in biodiversity and environmental science at McMaster, and he's pursuing a thesis in the Patricia Chow Fraser Lab. His focus is on amphibian indicator species, conservation, and community science. And he's going to be talking about novel techniques to confirm the breeding habitat of the Jefferson salamander in vernal pools. It's going to do so with reference to the use of remote sensing and environmental DNA. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-author and supervisor, uh, Dr. Pat Chow Frazier, um, and let's get into the talk. So the Jefferson salamander, it is a small cryptic amphibian uh, that is listed as endangered both federally and provincially. Um, its habitat is sparsely distributed to the northeast of North America, um, where it breeds in fishless pools and bodies of water, um, namely vernal pools, um, of which it is an important indicator species of these vernal pools, um, as it exhibits high site fidelity. So an individual re will return to the same pools year after year. And even if they aren't able to make it back in a given year, say something disrupts their breeding, they will still return to that site when they're able to. So if these sites are recurring, we will find Jeffersons in those sites. Um, in addition, the reason I call them cryptic, uh, the adults spend most of their time in burrows once they uh, are out of breeding season. They only return and become obvious during this breeding season in spring. Um, and this is primarily in deciduous forests where the, uh, they're not harmed by pine needles. Uh, vernal pools. So these are depressions, local minimums within forests that become uh, inundated with water whenever there is a precipitation event. Um, eventually they drain, which is important. This lack of permanence means that they are not home to fish species, which would eat the eggs. Um, this uh, vernal pool on the left is actually in Bacchus Woods. It's a pretty uh, normal vernal pool. If we look a bit closer at the water, you can see egg masses within of some kind of salamander species. These are likely yellow spotted. Um, a major threat to them, which is probably the most major threat, is the loss of breeding habitat. Uh, we can see a map on the left. Uh, this is a data set from Dr. Jim Bogart of Guelph University uh, that extends up to 2019 of Jefferson Salamander preference, uh, presence. Uh, the darker blue spots, which you can see mostly in the Halton region, are more recently surveyed, while the lighter spots, such as the ones in the Long Point biosphere, uh, were surveyed less recently. Um, and as you can tell by their proximity to the GTA, uh, they're in an area that has been largely impacted by uh, both agriculture and urban development. Um, since colonization, a lot of the forests that these guys require have been uh, destroyed. Um, this loss is especially severe in southern Ontario. And those vernal pools that are remaining are fragmented by roads, meaning that when they migrate during their breeding season in spring, uh, they are likely to be hit by cars, uh, further exposing them to mortality. The recovery plan for Jefferson salamanders um, has three objectives stated. Uh, to map all breeding habitats, which includes the vernal pools we are interested in, to identify any formerly used sites that can be restored, and to protect breeding habitats from land use alterations. So with these objectives, we ask ourselves, what can our research do to assist with this conservation? Um, specifically, what are the methods that we can map these breeding habitats? Um, what are the methods by which we can assess these breeding habitats for restoration? And how can we use uh, community volunteers and interact with them to assist with these activities? 
So when we're talking about the limitations of mapping uh, these breeding habitats, we have quite a few. Uh, vernal pools are small, they're semi-permanent, they're not guaranteed to show up in any orthophotometry or uh, satellite imagery that you're taking because they may simply not be there in the time that you're taking it. Um, in addition, for the air photos and satellite, uh, as you can see, they're not exactly obvious seeing through the canopy. Um, and if you're looking when they don't have a canopy, that's not during spring, which is not their breeding season, so even if they are filled, that may not be a pool that they can use. Um, and additionally, uh, Jeffersons are really hard to distinguish from similar ambistoma species, specifically the blue spotted and the unisexual dependence on both species. Uh, so playing a game here of which ambistoma is the Jefferson, uh, we have four contendents, uh, contenders. They, some of them are, might be Jefferson, some of them might be Jefferson hybrids. Uh, one of them is definitely a blue spotted. But the key thing to take away from here is that we need DNA confirmation to actually know if something is a Jefferson or one of the hybrids or a blue spotted. So the way we do that conventionally is that you would live trap them along their migration back to, back to their breeding sites. Um, and that is associated with handling disturbances that are not studied, but could have a negative impact. Um, anyone who's worked with uh, wildlife rehabilitation knows the effect of stress on wildlife. Um, and then once you have them, you can take tail clippings uh, to genotype and confirm their actual DNA. Um, now, this is an invasive procedure, and while they do regenerate in similar species, it's not studied on what the energy cost of this is, but there is an energy cost. Um, and then finally, you would use radio telemetry to track them as they move back to the uh, sites that they used to breed. Um, and this is how you'd get kind of new sites to expand or distribution no uh, knowledge. Um, this is labor intensive and costly. Uh, you need to have the right machinery and also something important, the expertise. And you need to train people up to be able to track them in this way. Um, so it's made it quite difficult to move kind of further beyond one step at a time of one pool to the next pool, which is a slow process when we're trying to understand the distribution through all of southern Ontario. So our lab's proposed approach um, starts with using that historic database given to us by uh, Professor Jim Bogart going up to 2019. Uh, we will then use LIDAR, or we have then used LIDAR to map depressions within southern Ontario and overlay historic breeding sites to create best bet current breeding sites. So trying to figure out where they're most likely to be still. From those, we can collect water samples for the analysis of eDNA during spring and use uh, a lab primer to confirm the eDNA of Jefferson salamanders in those vernal pools. So focusing in a little bit on each aspect of that methodology, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. I'll go over this really briefly because I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with it here. Um, basically, as you fly along, you bounce, a, uh, you bounce a pulse of light off the ground and measure the amount of time it takes to come back. The longer it takes, of course, means the lower the ground is. From that, we can build up what we call a digital terrain model, which you can kind of see being built on the right side of the lowest points and the highest points, um, which we see in that kind of shadowy image in the bottom left corner. It's a little hard to interpret at that uh, uh, way of looking, but the lighter points are higher, the darker points are lower. From then, we could process it into these tan, uh, tan patches on the rightmost image um, that are the depressions. And the way we do that is based on a method developed by Elaine Marzek, a former master's student of the Pat Chow Fraser Lab for her master's thesis in 2023. Basically, you start by smoothing the LiDAR data to uh, reduce commission error. Um, then we go through a depression routine, which basically maps out all of the little pools that water can flow into. From there, we exclude by area and wetland. So excluding by area, we don't want something too large, that's likely an unmapped wetland, and we don't want something too small, that's probably just a little bit of crag that would not actually hold water long enough to have the Jeffersons breed in it. Um, and the area range we found was between 35 square meters and uh, 3,500 square meters. Um, and then five meter buffer from the wetland, because we want these to be the impermanent vernal pools. If something is within five meters of a wetland, it's probably just being constantly recharged by that wetland, and it is therefore not an impermanent pool. Uh, and lastly, we can use a machine learning uh, random for forest algorithm that's been trained off of vernal pools in, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Georgian Bay, um, to get a more likely guess at which one of these potential vernal pools is actually a, a vernal pool and which one isn't. Um, so the way that actually looks, I know that's a lot of words, um, what we'll get at the end of that is these tan patches are all potential vernal pools, and then the green patch right here is a wetland with this kind of seafoam patch being our five meter buffer from the wetland. Um, then we'll overlay it with our historic breeding sites, which you can see as the red dots on this one here, all around. 
And to look a bit closer on like the way we'd actually do this, you can see this red dot falls within the wetland. So that's likely one that is either breeding within the wetland or close enough that it's something being regenerated by the wetland, so we're not very interested in it. Um, and another thing that's kind of a challenge with these is you can see this chain of a bunch of different uh, potential vernal pools along here leading into the wetland. It's possible that that's actually a series of small fragmented wetlands that is simply too small to be mapped by our, uh, our wetland layers. Um, so it's something to think of when you're actually going to these sites of, is this a wetland or is these actually vernal pools? Um, it's pretty clear when, once you're there. So all of these ones that are outside of the wetland and are of the right size are something that we'd be interested in as our best bet breeding sites, from which we'd then go to do eDNA sampling. Um, so a really big benefit of eDNA sampling is that it's an extremely simple and easy process, which means volunteers can be trained to do it. All you need to do is to go up to the pool, uh, draw out a, an amount of water, pass it through a filter, we found 0.2 micrometers worked best, then use forceps to store that filter in a buffer solution, and then return it to a lab for eDNA analysis. So for in spring of 2023, we went through the, a, a, this procedure as kind of a pilot program, just us, and these are our results. Um, before I go through anything specific, uh, you can see the gray dots are from the Jim Bogart data set. Those are the existing sites that we did not uh, what's the word, sample in this uh, uh, sampling effort. And then the ones with green and red are ones that we did, with green being positive for Jefferson presence and red being negative for Jefferson presence. Uh, beyond that, the circles, the dots, are existing sites that we sampled, and the triangular dots are, uh, are additional sites, ones that were not included in the data set, but we found uh, either had or did not have Jefferson's. Uh, so we took 22 eDNA samples this spring, um, primarily from existing sites. These samples were analyzed by Nature Metrics for the eDNA part, um, of which we got nine positive results. Um, and something I want to call attention to, you might notice that we have northern points right here that are much more northern than the rest of them. Um, these were based on, you can see there's still some existing sites down there that were not uh, super recently surveyed, but it's kind of an effort to try to figure out where the current northern distribution of Jefferson salamanders is, because we simply don't have enough data on it. Um, it might have been that those samples were taken too early, uh, as they were taken at around the same time we take them for the rest of southern Ontario, but in a colder latitude, it might be that their uh, actual reproduction happens a bit later, or the growth rate is a bit slower. Um, so those northern points are of additional interest for further study. Um, and you might notice, relevant, very relevant to us, a red site here that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and something of very big interest to me that was really cool, um, we got four additional positive sites that were not included in the historical data set that we can now add in, uh, which was very cool to find. Um, so case studies. I really want to zoom into three specific sites that we uh, looked into around here. Um, specifically, uh, a, a site where Jeffersons were detected in an active restoration project, a site where it was a historical site that had lost its population, as far as we can tell so far, and um, kind of related to the last presentation, um, an example of fencing and eco-passageways being, seemingly being able to mitigate the mortality of salamanders using a roadside vernal pool. So for the Jeffersons detected in a restoration site, we found these Jeffersons next to a historical site that had been degraded. There was no amphibian life within it. Um, you can see the one that we actually did find them within is also pretty degraded looking, uh, which matches. Uh, it appeared to be negatively impacted by runoff from a nearby ranch. Its total phosphorus was four, nearly 400 micrograms per liter, which you may note the water quality objective is 30. So it was incredibly nutrient loaded. Um, but it appears that these restoration efforts underway by the Nature Conservancy of Canada um, appear to be working. There are still Jeffersons in that area, which is a great sign. They're using these coir logs, which are coconut fiber, to block a bunch of the detritus coming off from that runoff from the ranch. Um, but there's still nutrient, uh, nutrient load getting through, so they're looking for a more permanent solution uh, for this site. Now, really relevant to the Long Point biosphere is a historical site that no longer contains Jefferson. Um, if you remember from the start, uh, this is in the Bacchus Woods area, an area I used to hike in a lot as a kid. Um, and when we sampled this, there were uh, seeming ambisoma larvae present at the time. However, we got a negative result from the eDNA. The last time Jeffersons were reported in the Long Point uh, biosphere was in 2005 and not since then. 
we're really lacking data, despite the fact that this is a 2023 species at risk uh, uh, recovery strategy. Uh, it's a mapped critical habitat area. This uh, Bacchus woods right here and a couple other points in the Long Point biosphere region are really important critical habitat, at least historically, for these salamanders. But with one site, we really need a lot more information. This is a site, uh, an area that can use a lot more further study. I'd be really interested to see how that goes in the future because they may be gone, but they may still be somewhere else here. It's only one site that we have data from, from this pilot program. So if anyone's really interested in running that, I'm happy to, be, to talk about that. Um, and the last case study, uh, fencing and eco-passageways. There was this vernal pool that was about like one and a half meters from an active road uh, that managed to have a lot of Jefferson uh, larvae in the 2023 breeding season. Um, it's a site that's been monitored and kind of uh, uh, protected by Ontario streams. And typically the road mortality next to a road, uh, adding in pollutants in addition to just the regular getting hit by a car type of roadside mortality, would be a severe limitation on this site's be uh, site being able to survive. Um, but the uh, Ontario Streams uh, mitigated collisions with cars using fencing that you can see right here and an eco-passageway that seems to have been able to allow these salamanders to migrate back, um, which is pretty hopeful and cool. Um, moving forward with this project, uh, we really hope to involve the community. Um, involving local citizens and community has been Upmo as utmost important for a project like this. Um, Michigan's actually got a really good program for this, the Michigan Vernal Pools Partnership. Um, they do a vernal pool patrol where a ton of communities go out uh, and survey vernal pools. This is incredibly important because there's only so many uh, undergraduate students you can throw at the problem. And there's a lot of sites to visit within basically a month of spring. Like it's end of May, halfway through June, you kind of have to get to all of these sites. Um, so community involvement, incredibly important. Um, we've contacted and are working with the Bruce Trail Conservancy and are looking to be involved with other groups as well uh, to gauge interest in uh, participating in a pilot program starting next year for spring. Um, so my plan uh, for fall of 2023, uh, finishing that up, and winter of 2024, um, is to prepare maps of potential sites around the Bruce Trail properties and also, if anyone else is interested, around those areas as well. Um, we're working on uh, developing primers for Jefferson salamanders and blue spotted, and also hoping to get them ready for the unisexual species so we can have a kind of more uh, uh, specific look at what species are there. Um, and then in spring of 2024, we can distribute sampling kits to the Bruce Trail uh, Conservancy volunteers, have them collect uh, eDNA samples and site information, and then send them back to us for processing. Um, and a way that I think I can improve this, and we can kind of keep working on our way of detecting these sites, um, Simons et al. Uh, 2023, which I believe a previous uh, presenter actually worked with, um, who also worked with Dr. Jim Boga using that data set, developed a species distribution model along the Niagara Escarpment um, using uh, uh, climate, land cover, and land usage, soil and topography variables to predict the likelihood of them occurring in certain areas. We can then use, they didn't use LIDAR because they didn't have the available processing power, but what we can do is add LIDAR to these factors uh, to then develop a map for all of Southern Ontario uh, to get likelihood across all of Southern Ontario um, and try to find the suitable vernal pools that we can then survey with a volunteer effort. Um, yeah, uh, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the funding uh, that came from the Habitat Stewardship Program and give special thanks to Dr. Jim Bogart for the historic data set and also for being kind of the guy to go to when it comes to Jefferson salamanders. Um, Elaine Marzek, the master's student who developed the GIS uh, method. Um, Kelton Adderley Heron, a PhD candidate student in the uh, Pat Chow Fraser lab, whose knowledge in vernal pools and uh, amphibians has been instrumental to me understanding how this project goes. Um, uh, Karolina Trachinska, uh, who ran the water quality samples over the summer with some other summer lab students and the rest of the Pat Chow Fraser lab students for their help, um, as well as Adam Brylowski and Gary Hall of the Boot Trail Conservancy, Mark Heaton of Ontario Streams, Sarah Meyer, Kristen Ferguson, and Rick Simpson of the Nature Conservancy of Canada for all of their local knowledge uh, uh, and expert local knowledge. Um, so yeah, um, I'm happy to take any questions, um, and there's my contact information if you're interested in pro pro uh, being part of the pilot program. Thanks very much, Eli.
presentation was great. You kind of alluded to it on one of your last slides. The last time I looked into doing eDNA mm. for salamanders, the primers weren't available for the unisexuals. And I'm wondering if you're sampling um, ponds in multiple years since not all salamanders breed in the same year and Jefferson's represents such a small proportion of the population. Like, is it possible that if you didn't detect it, it could just be that no individuals went to that pond to breed in a oh, given year? Yeah, absolutely. Like, it could, these are all just singular data points. The idea of this project is just as an example of getting these methodologies to work. The hope is to continue sampling in the same way, both in the areas that we've already confirmed or sampled and haven't found them, especially if we have local knowledge of, hey, it appears that ambistoma are moving in this area, let's check this out. Um, so yeah, definitely multiple years of sampling effort is required to understand whether they are actually gone from a site, even if you get a negative result. Great, thank you. Oh, okay. Hi there. Um, I've thought about vernal pools and the selection of the salamander, those vernal pools, and three questions come to my mind. Would a salamander go to a pond because it successfully was born there, a return idea? Two, does it detect the presence of fish by taste or smell? Or three, does it somehow know it's a vernal pool? And I'm, I'm not really voting for number three. So uh, do you think there's other important things that you should be also trying to screen out for what makes a vernal pool selected by salamanders, such as vegetation cover, shading, um, but possibly a source of groundwater to supplement those years? I, I just find that looking for a depression as being a too limited or a too narrow a scope of finding these things, when probably those salamanders are looking according to a variety of characteristics. They're, they're they've been around for 200 million years. So yeah. They're pretty smart. Absolutely. Um, that's a, a very insightful question. Um, that's kind of the goal of the species distribution model, is to account for factors such as those. And that's my, uh, well, my concern going forward from this presentation, basically, is to include those factors when we're looking at these habitats. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, definitely not number three. They'll still reproduce in fishless uh, ponds. Um, they'll reproduce in wetlands. Um, the reason we're focused on vernal pools specifically is they are a unique habitat that is not considered, period, by the Ontario government. It's not considered a wetland. It's not under protection. Um, there are areas in which they are protected more or considered more, but southern Ontario is really not one of them. So we're trying to bring that understanding that this is a unique habitat we want to conserve. Where was the Eco Passages and um, Fence project oh, that yeah, you spoke absolutely. about? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Sorry, and, and, I should have mentioned and that. And is it working? Uh, so the question of is it working is something that would have to be like rigorously tested for me to say well. Um, but from anecdotal evidence, there really wouldn't be a, a Jefferson population that large right next to a roadside without something being different, right. um, which would seem to suggest it is doing well. Um, it's actually located in Halton, um, the uh, Caledon Hills area. Um, yeah, a lot of the data we have is around that kind of Halton area that's just been kind of yeah. the focus. I definitely don't think that's the extent of them, which points to the species distribution model of trying to expand our understanding to the rest of southern Ontario. Are you allowed to say what road, or you're holding that back? I think I'm going to hold that back. Okay, well, you can tell me later. <laughs> I think I know. I think I know. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Mark Keaton, perfect contact to get into the, uh, to, to understand and talk about that project. So, uh, Eli, uh, maybe this is going to reflect my ignorance of the, uh, the, the science, but is there any effort to reintroduce the um, Jefferson salamander? I was thinking of what Jessica said at the beginning, you uh, restore the habitat as step mm. one, and then, then you move to reintroduce in That's places like Bacchus Woods. Maybe. Yeah, um, that's not something that I believe there's any research papers on, as far as I'm aware. Um, if someone has some knowledge, I'd be happy for them to share that. Um, but one of the interesting things is they are a lot more common in certain states. So there could be a possibility for a reintroduction, given that they are not endangered in some states, and you could uh, therefore likely have more individuals there to move. Um, I do uh, specialize in butterflies, but I also dabble in salamanders. And um, <laughs> I haven't published it yet, but we did actually do a successful translocation of um, some Jefferson salamander from the Dundas Valley to one of our recovery sites in Kitchener. Um, it was a site where Jefferson had been extirpated, but the unisexual ambistoma are still there. This is why I asked a question about the eDNA, because yeah. we wouldn't have picked Jefferson and up there. But um, we did successfully translocate them. I raised them in situ and they seem to do okay, so it is possible That's to translocate them. That's really good to know. Um, I'd, you were also on yeah. part 
of, yeah. Were you also part, you, I think you had co-authorship on the Simons et al. paper. Yeah, uh, yeah, Siemens. I took a picture because she'll sorry. be, it was her first paper. She'll be so excited you presented <laughs> about it. Yeah, cool, let's connect. Okay, perfect, thank you. So thanks very much. Uh, we obviously have a break now. I think it's 3.45, people are to be back. So, thank you. Thank you.